Doubts down south. The shocking news coming out last week. The Dallas Jackals are no more and will not be participating in the 2025 Major League Rugby season. So we bring on a player from the team itself. Scrum half Brock Gallagher joins the show to shed some insight into what went down this offseason leading to the shocking news. Plus, getting the player perspective behind it all. The Fantasy Rucker Show starts right now. Where rugby and the world of fantasy sports collide. Welcome to the Fantasy Rucker Show. Bringing fantasy rugby to the masses. Talking all things rugby from the MLR to leagues around the world. We're on top of it. Headphones on, pads off. This is the Fantasy Rucker Show. Now, here are your hosts, Ryan Yee, Matt Yee, and Devin Vanderpool. What's up, everybody? This is episode 126 of the Fantasy Rucker Show. Thank you so much to our Fantasy Ruckers League members, our community members, and everyone else tagging along on our journey of making Fantasy Rugby a reality. Yep. The MLR. I am Ryan Yee with me each and every single week. Matt Yee. Devin Vandy Vanderpool is somewhere off in the Canadian boonies camping with his family. Usually that's me. Usually that and, is you. Uh, that is usually me, but somehow he found his way out. He took his took his family out there. I, I think I've heard word on the street as he's fighting off bears as we speak. Uh, uh, he's, so. he's getting ready to... Uh, to uh, well, to this maybe. is his off-season training, Ryan. That's this right. This is his off-season right. training. He's getting ready <laughs> for the Crossroads Cup to go to the Utah the Utah training camp. Right, right. Uh, he's just he's just building himself up for the season. Remember every every year right. since we started this thing, we try to get Vandy into enough shape to make it down to Utah's uh to skip. There's uh, nothing better than bear wrestling to <laughs> right, get you exactly. ready for a season of MLR. Exactly. Absolutely. Well, hey, we got a jam-packed episode 126 that we got to get right into. Obviously, we started off in our teaser. A uh, new special guest of the show. Obviously, we're going to get to the big news that came out in terms of the folding of the Dallas Jackals. Mm -hmm. And we are bringing on former scrum half of the Dallas Jackals, Brock Gallagher, onto the show to give us a whole bunch of insight into not only the season that was for this team, the most successful season for this Dallas Jackals franchise up to this point, but what all went down in the lead up to them announcing that they will not be participating in 2025. Some crazy stuff that uh, that Brock uh, had the conversation with us. So you want to stay tuned in for that. Of course, we're going to go over the latest news and notes from around the league. Might be the off season, but still a whole bunch coming out from there. And then also got a little bit of uh, of uh, rugby betting at the end of our show here in our Triple D Devin's Degenerate Dambles, brought to you by Betstamp here in our show. But again, um, this conversation with Brock, I think, reveals a lot of what has been happening over the course of this offseason so far when it comes to the Dallas Jackals. Uh, it's going to be exciting, Matt. You you and Brock have a, have a little bit of a history, competed at that nine position in your uh, your guys' uh, moving up the ranks in, yep. in the Rugby Canada system. It's going to be fun to reconnect with him. Yeah, it should be good. I haven't talked to him since I don't know how long, so it'll be nice to reconnect. Uh, Back when that jersey yeah. behind you fit you. Yeah, and now it definitely doesn't. So, <laughs> uh, so yeah, we'll... we'll uh, We'll see. It'll be it'll be a good time. I haven't right. talked to that man in a while, but he's always been a good guy. All right. Well, let's get right into it. But before we do, um, if you aren't already, give us a follow at the Fantasy Ruckers, uh, Instagram, X, Facebook, like, subscribe to us on YouTube. Uh, it really helps the channel uh, go a long way. Again, yep. we are trying to make this fantasy MLR thing a reality. And we share all of our news and notes, share all the updates uh, on our social media channels on how you can participate, how you can join in fun content like this when we bring on people from around the league onto our show. You get first in the know when you're giving us a follow at the Fantasy Ruckers. A lot of cool stuff coming down the pipeline this offseason. A lot of stuff that we're building up towards to continue making this a fun experience for our Fantasy MLR users. It's going to be fun, again, at the Fantasy Ruckers. You can join our Discord channel as well. It's our main communication platform among our Fantasy MLR League members, but also just a fun space to talk all things rugby. Uh, got a whole bunch of people in there, whether they're in the Fantasy Leagues in or not. They talk uh, both MLR and beyond um, when it comes to that. We also have fantasyruckers.com that has a whole slew of stats on that site, our main platform for Fantasy MLR. Check that out. Again, the fantasyruckers.com. All right, Matt, are you ready to get into some news and notes? 
Let's do it. All right, let's get into the latest from around the league before we get to our conversation with Scrum Half Broad Gallagher. Um, again, uh, we'll just start with it first between the recording of our last episode where we kind of speculated that this was something that was going to happen. We heard rumblings, more official sources coming out with it, but the league officially announced that the Dallas Jackals will not be participating uh, in the 2025 season. This is something that came out uh, within the last week um, after the recording of our last show um again just disappointing news obviously gutted um it's hard to take especially because of how optimistic dallas looked in this last season plus with everything that went down last off season just looked like we really turned a corner but i think this is a reminder we kind of alluded to it last show but now that the the official announcement is out that this is still a young league it's hard to break through the professional sports landscape, especially with a nuanced sport like rugby. It is going to show here how resilient this league can be. I don't think that this is a reflection of this league going in, in a direction of any bad space. I think this is a more reflection of kind of what went down in Dallas. And again, we'll learn more about that uh, in our conversation with Brock. Uh, but uh, just just disappointing overall to see this. Yeah, and we talked a bunch last episode, so I'm not going to say too much, but uh, I'm just looking forward to hearing what Brock has to say uh, because I'm sure he'll have some insider information on how it was from a player perspective. Uh, but yeah, always sad to see uh, we'll move forward and the league will continue to move forward. Uh, I think this is just something, like I said last episode, something that we have to get used to as a, as a fan base. And uh, and the league saying that obviously their focus is with the team, its players, and planning for another successful season in 2025. They say an announcement about the player dispersal process will be shared soon. Um, we'll obviously talk to Brock about that, and he might have a little bit of insider knowledge when it comes to how, when, what, all the all the five W's and the how of how this will all play out um, in terms of that information. All right, let's get on to some more positive stuff here. Uh, aside from the departure of uh, this Dallas Jackals team, there is still some movement um, in this offseason. And, and one that is a, a lot of fun to hear is that Junior Gaffa, uh, the uh, the rookie of the year, uh, like who this. played on the anthem is staying in Carolina and uh, they have officially made a trade. Uh, obviously he was on loan from the new England free Jacks, but the new England free Jacks are getting a 2025 second round pick an international slot and salary cap considerations um, in exchange for the service rights of junior Gaffa. So it looks like Gaffa is staying in, in Carolina, like I said, and uh, and New England gets a little bit of uh, draft capital, a little bit of money capital, and a little bit of international capital, if that's how you want to put it, uh, for their upcoming seasons. A player that from fantasy circles, very relevant, 162.9 fantasy yep. points in the year, um, was electric. You were very happy with him if you had him at your center position in yeah, this I sure, past year's uh, season. I sure was. Uh, and I'm, I'm excited to see him continue to playing with the anthem. I think he's just going to continue to be a star for them. Uh, and I'm looking forward to the next season and, and seeing where he goes fantasy wise. Now that, now that he's the star of this Anthem team. Yeah. And in the, in the regular season, uh, only scoring one tr uh, or, or excuse me, having one try assist and scoring four tries on the season. Didn't need the trash that, that, yeah, that could be something that goes up again. He had uh, four matches where he was above the triple digit meters gain total. Um, two games where he was in the twenties in the twenties for tackles and from a center position player. Like that's exactly what you want to see from a fantasy point production standpoint. So yep. junior Gaffa, we'll look to see if he can do that again in 2025 with rugby care, uh, rugby Carolina, the anthem rugby Carolina it always mixes yep. me up between that and RFCLA. It's 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 because the name stinks. Um, all right, well, let's go on to uh, some sources that we might have. But according to the Rugby Rant podcast, the sources that they have. So I don't know what you would call this. Is this like tertiary sources? We're getting this source. We are just an aggregator. <laughs> yeah, this there you go. News. Um, it, it sounds like the league is going to start in February, which should make uh, playoffs for the MLR uh, not interfere with the international break, or I should say vice versa. The international break will not interfere with the playoffs. This last year, we had a little bit of an awkward like pause between uh, the playoffs and some guys getting injured um, during their international tests, making it difficult for uh, them to compete in the playoffs, et cetera. But now I guess with this early start, that's not going to be the case, but it also lends the questions for those kind of more Northern teams 
like New England, um, like Chicago. Yeah, I don't know how that's going to be. It's going to be cold in February. And I could imagine that if I had to put a guess on it, they're probably starting the the first half, uh, at least quarter of the season, probably on the road. Yeah, I think Seattle will be okay. I mean, the BC Premier League runs through uh, February already. Uh, yeah, I think New England is probably going to be something similar to what Toronto had to do back in the day. Chicago, I mean, I guess we'll see, but with all you know, global warming, climate change, you never really know what the weather is going to be. Uh, but yeah, I, I probably think they're going to be doing a lot more away games early in the year, but that just helps them for their playoff run. We'll I, I would the, say we'll see how the schedule gets gets once it gets released. It's probably worth it, right? Like, you oh, yeah. know, we can stand being a little bit cold in February. I would take so I, I would take the cold early games and all the away games early, and take the home games later on in the season. That's true, to when it matters a lot more. Yeah, yeah, and to not have that break in between a playoff run is going to be hugely helpful yeah. as well. I think. All right. Um. Well, speaking of international rugby, before we move on to the interview with Brock Gallagher, uh, last piece of news that I want to mention is uh kind of a wrap up to the Pacific Nations Cup. Obviously, a handful of teams been overseas: U.S., Canada, um, taking on the likes of Tonga, Samoa, Called Japan. Um, you did call this one, and uh, it's the U.S. Uh, uh, making it to that kind of third round matchup against Samoa, and they lost surprisingly, eighteen or not so surprisingly, eighteen to thirteen on the last well, minute hey, try was, by Samoa. A lot closer than what people close, thought. Uh, but Samoa probably could have done more. Probably could have scored more. Uh, but hey, it is what it is. Samoa is a, a a class side, and then I'll also shout out just Fiji for. For winning the entire thing, uh, Fiji is also a very good side, and they beat a very good Japan side. Yeah. So again, just a whole lot of experience for many MLR guys overseas uh, in what was, uh, 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 I guess, a uh, competition full with experience over there in Japan. Um, yep. From the U.S. standpoint, I think they would be kind of, you know, partly content with how they they played here um canada obviously on their the fourth they are fourth the teams that were higher ranked than them samoa fiji and and japan right so, exactly so not um, much else you can i guess we'll there. see and again we do have some more international tests coming up later in the season um and should be interesting to see how the u.s boys and the the canadian boys kind of continue to progress here as they move towards um more World Cup qualifications. All right, Matt, you want to get right to it, get to the juicy news and talk a little yeah. bit about what Let's the heck went on in Dallas? Let's skip Commissioner Yee's league update because we don't need that today because <laughs> we got more important things to talk about. The interview with Brock Gallagher. All right. Well, it is finally time to bring on our special guest of this episode 126, and that is Dallas Jackal scrum half Brock Gallagher to join the show. Brock. First time on, man. Welcome to the show, dude. Always uh, I love having uh, players from the league uh, hop on the Fantasy Rucker show, and and uh, glad to have you on, man. No, thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks for the invite. I uh, couldn't be happier to be doing this. You know, I love uh, spreading my story or the story of the league or whatever it may be. Or anything rugby-related, I'm always always happy to help out wherever it may be. Man, love, and love and in impeccable timing right now. I mean, you've got, I think, a pretty good story to tell at this point. I'm sure we'll get there later on when we start talking oh, yeah. about it. But it, to, I think Ryan's gonna, was about to touch on this, but it's hard to, before we look at maybe some of the not so great news, it's hard to look at, not look at some of the great news that happened over the past MLR season. Hey, Ryan? Yeah, yeah. We'll get into it right away. And I mean, yeah, we got to talk. Obviously, there's the elephant in the room that we got to talk about. And I think a lot of our viewers and a lot of the people tuning into this episode are, are going to be want to be in the know with, with what's happening with the Dallas Jackals. We talked about it in our news and notes segment. But again, let's look at the year that was first. But in case our viewers that don't know, uh, Brock and, and Maddie go uh, kind of way back here. Uh, kind of a bunch of good rugby Canadian boys having played on, uh, on some uh, Canada rugby together. And obviously, Brock doing a little bit better than my brother had uh take being able yeah. to to maybe make the knees last a little bit longer maddie hey nice. eh? just uh he runs uh, it runs a lot faster <laughs> passes a lot farther uh yeah yeah all uh, willing to tackle people something i wasn't willing to do oh, yeah all those things are pretty pretty crucial for uh you know making it pretty far in that game well you got to tell us brock on a scale of one to ten how good was maddie at the ninth nope. position why won't we start with there <laughs> no oh, honestly like during that time of year like that age grade of nines i think like we were all pretty equal and like we all brought little aspects to get like different parts of our game when we played but like yeah. 
it's hard to put a number on it just because like all even like Shelly as well like us three like we worked so well together was like no bad blood at all so can't really but like was- I think we're all on the same length that would give us all three of us an eight out of ten especially at that time and oh, how young go. oh, how, how old we were it's- it was good that's just a nice it's way that, that's, that's just a nice way of brock saying uh yeah i think he he knows he was a little bit better than you and, and his career so far i think shows it but anyways let's talk about it though brock i mean we got to talk about the dallas jackals and the crazy season that was um the most successful season that the dallas jackals have ever had in their franchise obviously it went to a slow start you coming in in this 2024 season i'm um, kind of at that scrum half depth position um just tell me, give us a little bit of insight into what was kind of uh, behind closed doors with this Giles Jackals teams. What changed um, since you were there that like kind of gave this team a spark and, and this new life of energy that made you do so well in 2024? Uh, well, going from like how the first two years went, um, obviously I had very little to do with that. Uh, but one of my good buddies that was involved was DeWald Kotze, the hooker, uh, who had an unreal season this year. Mm -hmm. Um, so he kind of gave me the gist of it. Like what happened, like we would talk all the time throughout those first two years and he would give me a spell, just like just a random banter. Cause I was predominantly just playing sevens at the time in California. So I wasn't really looking too much in the MLR and stuff. And then he actually ended up being the reason why I went to Dallas because he put my name forward. Cause, uh, after that rough season they had the year prior to this one, they needed another nine and a good, like a good domestic nine. So he put my name forward and then next thing you know, I ended up getting signed. Uh, but from like what I've heard of like the years prior the problem was that we were so strong defensively like we, there was no fear like we were well connected we got a bunch of the boys just put their body on line and like we had a great defensive system but the problem was we had no attack so the ca- coaches that had come prior which i have don't know personally i have never talked to them so this is nothing against them but like from what i heard is that like our attack was very bland and the problem was that we were stuck too much to a system so like if anyone went outside the system it was like a screaming match to the players, like saying, why are you doing this? Why? Like it made like our, a lot of the players on that team really like scared to actually try anything new. And so they just stuck to a system and the system clearly didn't work. So then what the Jackals did and what I've shown who I am like a huge advocate for and got really close with. And I is, I think is one of the best attacking coaches, one of the best coaches I've ever had in my rugby career for is Nathan Osborne. Like the, his brain and like his like, like vision of the game and an attacking sense, it just, opened up doors for our team and like the skill set that we already had there and then the the tools that we added in the off season leading up to that year it was just it was for him it was like christmas like he had all these options <laughs> he had all these players that he could pick from like all could do everything could play out of position play any, and all that type of stuff and still put to what his system and put it to work properly so i think that was probably the biggest thing because our defensive system was made from kuka who our coach augustine uh was really good like really strong and it showed in games like we were just willing to shoot, stay connected, no, no little, no gaps would be the odd time when we get tired. But other than that, like all we really needed was in a good attacking system. And Nate Osborne is the reason why I find. Man, you guys had one of the most electric offenses in the league and one mm-hmm. of the most fun to watch. I know we've talked about on the show all year long, just saying how exciting the Dallas Jackals were. Uh, and you like, yeah, it was, it was electric. And, and clearly that you've seen the turnaround, um, but yeah, it, it must have been such a fun year playing with those coaches. I got to ask you, talk about some of the firepower, um, but Vogan Isaacs, that guy Vogie. looks like one of the most electric players on your offense. And the, when he got hurt, it sucked. It was brutal for fantasy, for him, for Dallas Jackals, for your guys' offense. But what's it like playing with that guy and playing with a guy with that type of leg on him? I mean, his boot is ridiculous. Oh, man. It's hard. It's honestly hard to put into words because I actually got to know him pretty well because he would always come over to our place because DeWalt's also South African. So he'd come over and just raid our thing <laughs> and just be like, out of random time, what do you even message us? Just come right through our door. He's like, what's going on? Like, he was such a sound guy, like really down to earth and like super easy to talk to. Like, I can't say enough good things about him. But like, as far as a rugby player goes, the guy, his his uh, accolades prior just kind of showed the type of player he is. And mm-hmm. it's actually crazy that a player of his caliber not to like diss the MLR, but like the fact that he's not playing URC or something over there in South Africa. And the reason he had to come to MLR to get more game footage is crazy because his like accolades being U20 uh, spring box and like play, being involved with the the lions and stuff. Yeah. Just, he brought that over and it just made such a big difference. His experience, his knowledge. And like when he would bring into our meetings was just like beyond like, like words, like I can't even describe, like just his vision of being able to like pinpoint certain things and like how we should attack and like, what options should we take in certain scenarios of the game, whether it be the start, the end, the middle, like 
it was just his presence alone despite his skill set was great on the field but like just him being like he took a really good role of being a good leader especially the backs and when we yeah. obviously losing on the pitch was huge but the fact that he was still around and was with us going forward with his injury still showed that like it was a loss but we were still able to move on as a team and still produce electric backline uh, performances and still put it out but yeah, no, I can't say enough good things about him because even personally, like I came really good friends with him. So it just as like yeah. a, a not just a teammate, but as a friend, the guy's class. Like the the stuff he brings to it, just like me and like the team, is just beyond. We love, we love that. Yeah, Vo, what was it? I think Vogan Isaacs was our like halfway kind of sleeper pick that we had here on the Fantasy Rucker Show. We were like, man, was... this guy was like on no one's radar heading into the season, at least from a fantasy sense. And then like he was like one of the top pickups when he was like going off on a couple of those weeks there and just like showing off what he could do. It was incredible. And, and to hear, I mean, Brock, to hear that he kind of had that influence off the pitch too, just to kind of bring that perspective and that attacking mindset, I'm sure helped as well. I mean, you guys were the second highest point scoring team in the league, right? You go from a team that, like you said, kind of heard uh, the stories from before and kind of the the lack of, you know, creativity maybe and, and the lack of kind of, you know, presence in the league to going to where you are now. I mean, that's a huge step up. I mean, going from where Dallas was to 482 points scored this season, um, just behind the Seawolves at, at 498. Um, that, that, that's really cool stuff. Some other guys, though, that I want to touch on before we get into um, the playoff run that you guys had is we got to hear some insight uh, of some of the marquee names on the Dallas Jackals. One of them being Sam Gala, obviously young guy coming into the season, first overall draft pick. For you, um, just to give you some insight, he is absolutely beloved here in the fantasy world because he is just like an outlier among players when it comes to second row, back row players in terms of the numbers that he brings. Um, let's start with him. I mean, tell me about Sam Gola, the leadership he brings into the locker room and just like how big of an animal he is on the pitch. Because when we watch him, man, we're always we're always in awe. Oh man, that's another one. Uh, like <laughs> his, hey, like the statistics he puts up and the performances that he puts up and just it's everything dope. overall, it's it speaks volume because even in training on the pitch, like the guy is always constantly talking, even when we're bagged and stuff. He's the type of guy like after a Bronco, people are puking, having their heads down, just like <laughs> can't even speak English or anything. He's the first guy that says like he'll just scream out Blair out his favorite phrases was just like this is not for everyone. That's just like his favorite thing. Like after a hard day's training, he's just like it's not for everybody. So that's just the type of person he is. The guy, like, no matter what you put in front of him, he's going to do it. It doesn't, like, if it means just, like, walking across the street or climbing up Mount Kilimanjaro, the guy's going to do it, despite what, what gets thrown out. And, like, it just kind of just shows just because of work rate, which, like, I don't know. It's, again, another guy that I got to know really well personally, and he's a, fun, like, great guy, fun guy, just, like, outside of rugby. But, like, it's just the way he spoke. Like he was just, it was so smart and like, just well, like he was so well-spoken and everything he said, like, it, and it wasn't long. It was just quick. And he said the right things at the right time. And that's all he needed. And that's like kind of what he showed. And he was definitely more of a guy that I found that like put his leadership on the field and made it show than kind of a guy that needed to be vocal. And we just followed along. And that's just the kind of presence he brought on the team it was like, yes, he was good in the huddles and yes, he was great at speaking, but like the fact that he can not only just speak, but also put his words into action is the one thing reason why we followed him so well and continue will end for how, wherever we all end up. Um, we'll continue to like have that in the back of our minds of just how a great person he was and a great leader, just because he didn't just walk the walk, like talk the talk. He walked the walk. Two more names that I want to bring up. Sam Tuifua. I don't think I need to say much more than that. Um, the guy's just another animal on your team. Tell me about uh, Sam. Uh, he's a quieter guy, quite quiet, but once you get to know him, he's so funny. Great crack. Uh, <laughs> Uh, he's kind of a stereotypical little Kiwi boy, man. You know, like, I like, like he's just <laughs> gifted. The guy can literally just run crazy, uh, hit hard, and just oh, the yeah. offloading skills. And the guy's hands, man, I'm looking at him, I'm shaking his hand. It's like <laughs> wrapping over mine. And I'm like trying to do the whole, like the whole Fiji ball stuff. I'm like, I don't understand. Just a genetic freak. <laughs> but no, he, he was another guy, like, again, just naturally quiet, but just loves just loves to play ball he's just one of those guys that just like whatever you're like in training like he goes through it and like all of us like goes through the motions and does well and stuff but when you put that guy in a game situation it's just like a whole other beat something switches in his brain and the guy just <laughs> like oh ball carry easy tackle easy the guy obviously and it showed like he was such a big key part of our offense and especially at the back of the scrum like i don't know and i don't know what they do over there in new zealand like we've for how many years me and maddie have been watching and yourself like the all blacks just new zealand is in general even if they're not all yeah. blacks 
the, the, the products they produce over there, just like no matter where Something's, they go, they're going to yeah. dominate. <laughs> Something's yeah. in the water, man. Something's uh, in the water. It's um, last thing before Maddie kind of hops on to some playoff talk here, I just want to get your uh, insight on Juan de Oliver. Obviously, you being a nine, yeah. um, just to talk about his play and more so than that, Brock, but like, what is it like as a younger nine who's obviously, um, you know, trying to grow and get better and, and now making a name for yourself there on, on Team Canada to learn from a, gua- a guy that has that experience like Juan and even just some of these other guys? Like, what is it like to get these pointers from Vogan and get these pointers from from Gala and, and Tui Fua? Like, and I'm sure Juan, because he plays your position, plays a big role in that. What's kind of the insight behind that, your relationship with the Oliver and just kind of uh, how you've grown so much from these players? Yeah, no, uh, JD and I had a good relationship. Um, obviously, it was like one of those things you play different positions, same thing like Maddie and all I went through when we were going up. Like, you know, at the end of the day, like we're good friends, we're good buddies and we want nothing but the best. But at the end of the day, competition is competition. And you obviously, especially with the kind of the, the time I got, uh, I definitely feel like I got um, – shafted in a way just before it's like the way I performed and then obviously put on the wing quite a bit uh just because I, I athletically I can but like he's really young like I think he's only 21 going on to 22 so but like the knowledge that kid holds and just like his scent of the game is just unnatural like his ability to read the field is a bit and like go through game film and like see and like go through trainings and kind of just say see something and bring it up as an idea and then we go through it it was just like it's a, uh, it was one of those things that you just can't teach per se. Yeah. Like he just has a knack for it. And it just shows like coming from a rugby country, like South Africa, went to Grace college, played good rugby, went part of the cheetah system. Like he's been through it all. So he's had also been under Ruben Pinar, who's a legend yeah. in rugby. So like he brings that wealth of experience at just such a young age. I think he's got a very bright future himself. And obviously like right. wherever he ends up, obviously we have to go through this draft. So hopefully he stays in the MLR. Cause you know, young guy at his age gets more film and I can definitely see him playing in the Curry or probably the URC for some team in SA, but learning from him, um, it was just like, again, like me being older. So it was funny, but uh, me learning from him was just kind of just overall like game sense in a way too. just like, obviously being a nine, you have to be able to read the field and it just comes like a knack and a nat and that like being natural. But with him, like you, you just learn little things like as far as the breakdown or like kicking times and when to do it. It's just like those things that you pick up despite, like whoever it is. And so, yeah, nothing but good things to say about him. Uh, he's, he's also quite quiet when he first came in, but after that he was another, like, like myself, it's like one of those things where do you find the mute button on the channel changer, you know, <laughs> the stereotypical nine stuff. So, but not nah, yeah. he, he, great kid. Great. Honestly, he's got a great future ahead of him and, you know, I wish nothing, wish him nothing but the best. I know I'll see him around somewhere and we'll have this, have good chats like always. But other it's- than that, it's it's crazy, man. Like, even though these guys coming from overseas, especially the guys from New Zealand, especially the guys from South Africa, uh, even though they're younger, they come in with that inherent inherent sense, like you said. It's so weird. Like I I've always I've always had it when you play with with guys overseas. And even though they're younger, even though you feel like you've had more experience, they have this like one little thing that they just have learned from their like three or four, right? But it's it's crazy. But anyways, uh uh, related to, I think less about other guys that you played with more about you and talking about specifically the playoffs going into that matchup with Houston. What was your mindset going into that? Everyone game? counted you out. Ev- <laughs> we, we, we counted you out. Oh, uh, honestly, I wouldn't blame and, you. Yeah. Yeah. We, I mean, we, we thought, look, Houston is Houston is what, what did Vandy say? Houston is a, uh, Vandy always said that he, they were something, but essentially they were a lock. They were a lock to win. That's what we were saying. That's what everybody was saying. You can bring but it back. Was, you can yeah. bring it back to, and I, I'm I'm gonna throw Andrew Coe uh, under the bus here. So when you met back meet up meet him up at Canada Train, you yeah. can tell him we did our playoff prediction show with Coe, and he counted you guys out, and he had Houston yeah. winning it in the end. So when you go back, you tell him that we told, showed you what's up there. Oh, yeah. Don't worry, I'll make sure to bring that yeah. up in the, the team room <laughs> for sure. But that's funny. It's all nothing but good banter. But yeah, 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 I'm just yeah. but anyways, man, just crazy. What, yeah. yeah. Matthew's point just what, what was that what was that yeah what was what was your mindset what were you thinking about going into it and what was the feeling around the team as you went into a matchup that you were pretty big underdogs I would say it was well obviously unfortunately I didn't get to play in that game because after the yeah. July test I ended up coming back with a little bit of a hamstring uh niggle so I had to deal with that and but like as far as being around the team and stuff uh confidence wasn't an issue because like the, the two yeah. games prior like 
what we lost to a total and the two games added up to Houston by like what five points like the first game we lost to the kick of the death and the second one same thing right in front of the sticks penalty last play so like if you like again it's one of those things you look at our record and it's just like oh six and ten making playoffs so like imagine if they went back to a three playoff format Dallas wouldn't even be in these chatters right now mm-hmm. so like again you look at it just like from a spectator point of view it makes sense but like if you look at overall gameplay and like the way Houston plays and which again, I'm not a huge fan of is like a really kicking dominant game <laughs> aerial, especially in Houston where the wind is you're going. Not the, everywhere. You're not the first person to say this. Yeah. Who yeah. came on saying the same thing. Oh, so man. it seems like, it seems like there's a, there's a pattern here. <laughs> yeah. And like, which is great. And which a, a team like Houston, like, come on, like you saw our offense all throughout the year. We saw the statistics despite our record. We gave up some games. There was definitely some games. And we talked about all the time that we just gave to teams. Like our record yeah. definitely didn't show how our record should have ended. But like, Agreed. why would you want to kick the ball to one of the most dangerous offensive teams from anywhere? We attack from our 22, we'll attack from your 22. And the, the results is like either the pit stick, the ball is going through the sticks or putting it behind the, the line. Like, mm-hmm. so realistically, we had no confidence. We're like, okay. I mean, we had so much confidence. In fact, okay, they're going to kick the ball to us. The whole mm-hmm. biggest worry we have to do is catching that thing. And then now we play our game. Because at the end of the day, and it showed in that game too, how like gassed they were on defense after the first Mm -hmm. like 30 minutes and we were just rolling. And I think what we put, like, we just used that, like their, their biggest strength and made it their biggest weakness for like the fact that they just didn't learn, stop kicking us the ball and just start playing and just start actually testing us. Because we never felt tested as on defense. Like there'd be times, yes, but like overall, if you look at like the game and how the statistics and how it ran, like when we had ball in hand and possession, like, making line breaks, we're throwing through waves, we're putting shots on them right up the middle, outside wide, and we just, and we broke them, I think, as that, like, and they just didn't want to, like, adjust, and I think they just came a little bit, and obviously not to attack them, because I do, like, have a lot of respect for the boys at Houston as well, it's just, like, I think they got a little too complacent in ways, is the fact, like, yes, they're, the record throughout the season, they were dominating teams, except for us, but in the regular season, (laughs) Uh, but yeah, I, I, I wasn't too worried, to be honest, a lot of us weren't too worried, I, but a lot of believe if we beat Houston, we're going to the, the Shield. Obviously, yeah, same thing with in Seattle happened, but right, I guess we'll yeah. talk about that later. But, like, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's just one of those things. Like, we pinpoint and made an effort at making their strength our strength and using that and turning it into their weakness, which is give us the ball and we'll attack from anywhere. We're not going to kick the ball. We don't want it. That's not our game. It's never been our game all year. So what we're going to do is we're going to punish you. It's almost like it was kind of the – kryptonite for them you know what you guys had that special mix and that special ingredients of players kind of in your roster that kind of complemented attacking houston and their game style again like kind of to maddie's point like when andrew co was on the show he was like man i hated playing against houston because there's their game style was just like not fun to play as a back so i you're kind of with that same sentiment there but um I mean, what was the feeling like afterwards amongst the team that like after everyone counted you guys out that you guys came away with the big time win and like I mean, it wasn't, it was convincing, like 34 to 22. Like it was not like you guys like squeaked past it. Like you guys made a statement. I mean, like you kind of said, it must have been a feeling of no one's going to stop us at this point. Yeah. Like, yeah, it just, and that was the biggest point. It just stems down to really just the fact that everyone wrote us off. Don't matter how well we did, don't matter how Mm -hmm. many teams we surprised and how many teams we shocked don't know how many points we put up didn't care how exciting we were at the end of the day we were always put up against and it showed in the prediction like the percentage thing i don't think there was a single yeah. game except for the anthem game maybe at the second game of the season or third <laughs> game of the season where they gave us the probability to win i think every game team we played against we were yeah. always picked to lose so that was like honestly like again fuel to our fire like we made everyone eat their words and that was like our main goal and so, and like the feeling after, like obviously messaging all the boys, like it was, I can just imagine the drive back. A lot of the boys, when we went to go say, like welcome them and stuff, like the injured guys, we went and get welcomed and stuff. Cause me and Mitch drove over to go pick up Dewey and stuff. Cause he was our roommate in Dallas and all the boys, it looked like they, the beers were flowing. Cause there's a lot of slurred <laughs> words and a lot of guys looking like they were doing the chicken dance on the way over to their uh, pickups. Funny. Like, so, like to hear that. Yeah. And, and Hey, it didn't affect you in the, in the following week either. Cause you guys put up an absolute fight and you got a chance to actually get in the lineup in that one uh, and make an impact. But you guys put a fight against that Seattle team who was, who was very good. Oh, especially in Seattle. Like we know, we yeah. know that we know the history of Seattle on their home record. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like no scarier place, no worse place to go for a semifinal to get into the yeah. shield. Eh? But yeah. you know, it came, it came, eh, you know, I got some opinions on that and like how it should have played <laughs> out, but you know, 
it is what it is. And, you know, we took it on the chin. Uh, well, took it on the chin expecting to come back and, you know, put up a performance for this season. But now we know that's not happening. But mm-hmm. it was one of those things you, like, live and learn from. And I think wherever, like, the coaches and the players go, it's, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a learning, not a failure. And we all grow from it. And hopefully this helps benefit the rest of the league wherever we may land with any every other team. Sure. So, again, it, it's one of those things. But I guess we'll, if we want to get into that, we – Ask me, ask yeah. away, and I'll. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, well before, before before we get, yeah, yeah. I was gonna lost. say, I was gonna say before we get into that, I know Ryan's gonna get into the fantasy stuff, but man, as Ryan's pulling up some of these fantasy stats, I just want to say that I don't think the fantasy stats, just because, like you said, you got shafted with some of the opportunities. I think you had a hell of a year. Every time you got in the field, I was like, I can't believe I was at the same level. This kid, <laughs> like this guy, is way better than I'll I, I could ever be at the moment. Or even then, uh, you just looked unreal. It's been crazy kind of just seeing this kind of uh, ascent from seven specialists to PR7s, now to Dallas Jackals and and, and to Canada. Uh, But I just wanted to preface that before we look at the fantasy rankings because fantasy rankings skewed to game time. The fantasy rankings skewed to, you know, uh, constant, constant 80 minute performances or 70 minute performances, but I don't want to let that, let that break, <laughs> t- make sure the fans know, just, no, just think no. of it, putting out, think of it, putting Brock, out some quality play this year, man. Think of it, Brock, as one of those underdog things again, right? You just got to take this on the chin. <laughs> yeah. Whoever gets you next season, you just have this number that I'm going to tell you right now, posted in your bedroom, uh, in your, in your bedroom wall. And you just look at that number every day and you say, you know what? I'm going to prove those, uh, those, those fantasy Rutgers a-holes wrong. Uh, oh, man. Season, it's it's so. like that Armand St. Brown thing where the guy put all the names of the guy at wide receiver. Yeah, exactly. Before, and he reads it every day before training a game. It's one of those things. But no, I'm, yeah. I'm Maddie and Ryan. I appreciate it. You know, same thing. Like, <laughs> numbers are numbers and i think the fantasy is great but again i definitely when i did get on i think i i know myself that i made the impact and it showed and my i definitely have a i feel personally think i have a bright future in the league and it yeah. you know warranted more i think some starts and more game time but hey it is what it is new journey new opportunities coming up for me and i got definitely got some exci- exciting news that are g- going to be coming out in the next couple of weeks as well where i'll be going so i've had cool. some interest so let's go yeah very so cool. I'm, I'm very excited it's a new journey right. a new time so We'll get into looking ahead here, but we love playing this game with players that come onto this show. So before I get into your points, because I know we were talking off the air here, Brock, that you are a fantasy football guy. So you know how this works and you know oh, how yeah. uh, where this all stems from. So if you had to take a guess here on who finished as the best Dallas Jackals fantasy MLR player, who do you think it is? Oh, I would have to go with Harold Gomez Vara. Is that so? I feel right, like final answer. I don't want to go against my buddy Dewey, but yeah, it has to be Hermano. Man. The, guy, the guy's performance is for sale. Close, 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 but it's actually Tui Fua. Sam Tui Fua oh. got the number one. Gomez Bar was number two. So Tui Fua came with 154.1 fantasy points there. Um, oh, wow. Just an electric season that he had. Um, yeah. Even even starting late, like if if Sam played the full season, oh. he would have been up there with yeah. with with some of the guys uh, like Semi Kunitani's of the league, just some of these guys in the league that were just taking it by storm. Yarnamo Gomez Vara, 124.3. So not too far behind another asset. And then the best back, uh, Mitch Richardson at 122. What a year, hey, Brock. Uh, oh, that's, my, that's my roommate. Grand. I love Mitch. There you go. What a Mitch year, is, Mitch is my boy. Yeah, that there guy, you he go. He's so good. He's such a stud, man. Uh, yeah. I love watching him play and being his yeah. teammate. The guy is just so good. And then always got to show some front row players some love. So your boy, Dewald Coates, uh, 120.8 fantasy points Ooh. for him. So that's a lot as a front rower. He was that one of the number lot. one guys there. Um, front rowers often, as, unless they're scoring it on those kind of set piece mall tries, they're not really getting points. But Coates, I mean, coming off that week, he was the the hot pickup after that week one performance when he scored three tries there. Uh, yeah. It was, it was oh, then the week, week six after he scored five tries. Yeah. I, don't know how many, I don't know how many beers he must have had after yeah. the game. Oh, my God. So then, then you had that, to celebrate. That leads uh, to the final question then, Brock. So you hear Sam getting 154.1, 124.3 for your Arnold Gomez Barra. I will give you the number for your scrum half mate, Juan D. Oliver. You got 76.8 fantasy points. Mm-hmm. What do you think you got this season? What? It's 35 pushing it? Is that your final answer? <laughs> yeah. I'm not, I'll hope I'm lowballing <laughs> myself, but yeah. <laughs> 28.4 so not too bad again 
for for a guy coming off the bench, that's electric. And you finished off the season with a few performances that were definitely like worthy. Like I know after the first three weeks, like people were talking, like, hey, this guy, like, if he gets time, like he's just kind of has that attacking ability. So 2.3, 4.3 in rounds two and three, that big time try performance in round 17 got you 7.1 fantasy points there. So hey. The metrics are there. Just like someone give this guy some time. And Brock, you're going to be a guy that's going to be uh, going to be Sleeper fantasy pick. relevant, man. Yeah, there you go. There Sleeper go. pick. Yeah. There you go. But uh, yeah, always fun to kind of get the reaction of the of the boys of the league, kind of how this fantasy MR thing works. So you can tell, uh, don't don't let it get to Mitchie's head too much uh, with the 122 fantasy points that he got. Uh, but again, put that 28.5 up on your on your wall and use that as motivation for, for next season. Oh, yeah, that's going to my notebook. So every time I go up for next go. team meeting, I always look at it first thing <laughs> over up on the page. So. There you go. Well, let, let's move on then and let's talk about the elephant in the room. I know that people want to get the insight into this and I know this is a hard conversation to have, but um, I think a lot of people want to hear what it's been like for the players the past several weeks because I'll, I'll kind of lay out the framework and Brock, I'll let you then get into it. Yeah. Um, there are rumors kind of flying around, right? We kind of heard rumblings. Last week, uh, we talked about kind of the speculation and people hearing kind of more legitimate sources kind of saying that the announcement obviously coming out late last week before that there was kind of chatter on social media of people hearing about something like this happening um take us through the timeline of kind of when you realized this was something was going to happen and and kind of your reaction when the official news came out last week oh well i can tell you right now i like just straight up tell you we didn't know this was happening a lot all mm. of us didn't know this was happening until the end like when me and dewey and all the other dallas boys were in camp for pncs in Victoria, really? we didn't find out. To, they literally, apparently, they've known about this. We lost thirty percent of our investor group at the start of the year. We didn't know this until literally the end. Our ownership group put us up for sale when we made the playoffs. Didn't tell us, and then they put up oh when my. we beat Houston. They put up, raised up our price even more since now we're becoming more oh. of a hot commodity. Didn't even know that until now. Like we literally, I, me and Dewey and like Liam Murray and all those guys are just hanging out after a hard training session in, at Shawnigan for uh, the first week of PNC. Message from Sam Gola in our group chat. Oh, he's like, hey guys, heard you the rumbling. And, and I honestly was so oblivious to this. I've heard like, because I just signed also with like David Jackson at Arm Rugby for as my uh, agent. And he's been a great guy, and great class. And he literally told me, he's like, I heard rumors that there's a team coming to Mexico and like Dallas might be it. I'm like, no, I've not heard that at all. And next thing you know, rumors started coming kind of creep up with other agents and stuff and I, but we didn't think anything of it because like surely if there's anything happening, they would have told us right you know, literally first week of camp we wow. get this massive message like this whole thing spilling out like what's happening and then literally we didn't find out that the team was folding until literally like yeah like three four days ago and then the draft and now we're going through this whole process and like the, all this other crap so like it was Holy. yeah it was it was a it was a real like backhand like it was just like none of us were expecting us we're all just sitting there like in camp trying to focus on our national duties and we're like uh just, i'm not gonna have a job <laughs> and it's yeah. like so i was like this is not good timing but oh. i guess it's nature of the beast man it's like it's it's playoffs i mean uh it's uh professional sports like certain ownership groups there's certain people yeah. that you know like again i'm not gonna call names but there's because there's a lot of guys in that group that i've talked to and messaged and messaged me personally that i still love from the management group there's just there's what some certain one person in there that not all of all of the Dallas Jackals, including the staff, were not a big fan of, and it showed and like it, like everything, like very sleazy kind of snakeish type of behavior. So, but at the end of the day, we move on and get better, and like hopefully he learns from that or whatever. But yeah, yeah, it's one of those things that kind of came out of left field. That's such a shame. I mean, it, it's crazy because there's no way uh, there's you, the, with the season that you guys had, it was just all I could see was up and to the right in the future. And so it was such a, it was such a crazy thing for us and us reacting to it. So I can only imagine you, but I guess thinking, thinking now, and we're looking into the next steps of this, you talk about a draft and stuff like that. We've had over the past year, the, the upcoming of a, of the players association. Um, how much have they been involved with this? Have they been reaching out to the players? Have they reached out to you? Uh, what's been the relationship with them like throughout this process now? Honestly, really good because actually Sam Gola is our liaison. He's part of like, he was our like head guy with the NHL Players Association group. So he was our lead on the team. So when that got assembled, Sam put his hand up again, just showing the type of person, the type of leader he is and his character. He's been like that. So everything that we've learned has come through him. And he, every time something comes up, he's messaged us in our group chat or Dallas Jackals chat and given us everything and information sets up all our webinars, the times he talks to all the MLR guy, like all the head 
people in the MLRPA, like all those people. And even like the runner, the guys that, or I guess run the league. So like, it's been probably the easiest process going forward. He asks we, every question that everyone's asked, including myself, he always answers, gives good. And then, so this whole process between the dispersal draft and leading up to this has been smooth. It's just the timing mm-hmm. of everything. Like it's some, some of the yeah. stuff took longer than it should have. But again, that's not on Sam. That's not Sam's fault. That's not his worry. That's not his right. job to figure that out. That's the ownership group. But like everything that we learned was literally within instance of Sam knowing when Sam knew, we knew. So it, it's yeah, been nice. honestly, that's been a great thing for us. It's it's yeah. it's crazy to think, though, just like the lag that it took for Sam to find out or your team to find out that this was all happening. Like that shocks me. The fact that you guys are heading off to PNCs. And like, it's funny because we've been hearing rumors kind of probably to the same extent that you guys. And I guess this just goes to show you how much players are in the know compared to us who are kind of just outside looking in. I don't know how much outside looking in we are actually there because it sounds like you guys are just as much kind of not in the know when it comes to these types of things. Um, Before we talk about kind of what you know at this point, tell me and give me insight of what the mindset right now is for the Dallas Jackals players. What are those conversations happening in between the players? Like how gutted are you, were you guys to find out like kind of what Maddie was saying, like you guys were up and to the right. Like once the season finished and you guys upset Houston, like it was the talk was all about, we cannot wait to see what Dallas is going to be able to put on the table next season. I know Dallas Jackals fans with several of them in our fantasy Rutgers community talking about how excited they are from, even from a fantasy sense, you guys were some of the players that you guys had were the marquee guys that people wanted to have on their rosters. Those same guys, what are those conversations like now? What was the reaction to you guys to find out the way you guys did and just kind of flat put it that Dallas isn't a thing next year? Uh, honestly, like to put it in like one short sentence is like, there was a lot of harsh words that I wouldn't repeat on, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. on, on this or anywhere in front or in front of my mother that I would say that came out <laughs> in those group chats. Yeah. Uh, no, it was a lot of shock. Like the guys, like the main leadership guys, the guys that talked the most in the dressing room, the guys that took the big leadership role and like the kind of the senior guys were definitely the more chattier ones. Like me and Dewey and Murray and all the guys at Canada, like, and the guys that we talked to closely when we ran into them were like, we would have our own little micro chats, but other than that, it wasn't too like crazy. Other than the facts, it was just the simple questions. Like what about the international guys? Where do we go from there? Like a lot of our RG boys, like obviously a lot of them are in the yeah. dispersal draft, like they all optioned in, but honestly for a thing that was, is would be de- seen as quite crazy and quite stressful. There wasn't a lot of chatter other than a lot of anger, but other than that, I think leading into this week, there's been more chatter and stuff between the boys and we just kind of been like making banter of it, and, like jokes. So yeah. it's been pretty chill. It's really turned a leaf. And as far as people going from wanting to pull out pitchforks and all that type of stuff <laughs> to more like making jokes about it and like just kind of seeing where kind of little chats of where, you know, who has interest in who, where are you going? Like this type of stuff, like just seeing yeah. how, seeing where the open market's looking. Um, but not nah, like, I, I just feel really bad for the international guys because realistically for domestic, like it's one of those things like we, it's a lot easier for us. We don't have a cap on how many of us can play. Like this is literally like the league for us. Sure. Right. So I, I felt a lot of, for the guy, a lot of the international guys that I grew really close with, like that is definitely like, this is their livelihood right now. Like a lot of them are young, but there's some older guys that like, we don't really have like, I don't know much of a plan after this. So I, I, we would have chats with them and stuff, making sure that they're all good and stuff. So it was definitely more of a, for us domestic guys looking after the international guys in a sense of just making sure like they're set up their plans and like stuff. And like, if they needed like any support, like let us know type of thing and we'll do the best we can. Like there's only so little that we can do, especially from such a far away distance. Cause they're obviously all back home, mm-hmm. but the chatter was pretty minimalistic other than the crazy three days of angry people <laughs> and pitchforks. But yeah. other than that, it's been just more just looking after each other and like staying close as, as humanly possible because the bond and like again when we talk about our performance at Dallas it wasn't just the field stuff like the reason we were so successful compared to the other two years and what from what Dewey has told me is that the fact that we were so like more connected and stronger together as like a team we were like one of our one of our big like favorite quotes was like we're not teammates we're just we're mates like there's difference between teammates and mates and we just thought saw each other not only as teammates but as mates and that's how we went into every training session every game whether selected or not it was it was all for all for the better of the team and all for the better for your like your your buddy right beside you in your locker room. It wasn't just an individualist, uh, an individual just, thing. Yeah, and I mean, just a year ago or two years ago, I'm trying to remember off the field, the Dallas Jackals were falling off of catwalks, <laughs> and uh, and Dude, now the stories and now, I got from that. Oh and, my, and, so and, funny. And, and, 
and now you guys, now you guys are worth thriving off the field and, and being mates, not just teammates. But last question on this, I think it's kind of taken away from the past looking future. You said you got the dispersal draft coming up. You said that you got some big, big news to share in a couple of weeks that are coming down the pipeline. Anything that you can share with us now in terms of what the next steps are for you uh, and what the next steps are for all the other players as well. And and as you sort that out in your head, Brock, and what you can and cannot tell us, I will <laughs> Honestly, say that's what I'm trying that, to figure out here. <laughs> I think I so I'll give you some time here um, because I think that's the big thing that fans and and MLR fans and and total are like yearning for because I think there has always been this feeling of lack of communication between the league and the fans and being having the fans in the know. Um, so I think they would appreciate whatever you can say, because we haven't heard anything with regards yeah. to what next yeah. steps are. So whatever you can tell us, whatever you can tell the fans about kind of what's progressing your forward, um, I think everyone would appreciate it. Not to put too much pressure on you and of no, course, no, only no. what you can say. Honestly, I haven't <laughs> been told anything as far as like what I can and can't say. So I'm going to throw like, you know, caution in the wind. So I'm a pretty open guy. I'm pretty vocal. And like, I have no, like, I don't steer away or fear that type of stuff. If I get in trouble, it is what it is. You know, it's one of those things. Um, I did immediately, actually, one of the first teams to actually message me was out a team out East. It was actually Miami. Mm. Um, so we were saying, yeah, Miami was a team that's up on the table. Uh, but I did recently today just sign and I'm staying in the West, like a letter of a uh, letter of intent. Um, I don't think I can actually say the team, but I'll I'll keep. That's okay. Honestly, hey, it's not hey, good for the teams. Let's... It's probably not good for the the fans. I can't say it on the air, but I, off air, I can probably give you guys an inside scoop All of right. where. Okay. But I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. in I'm in the West. I'm sticking in the West. Okay. Uh, and I'm can't be more excited just like the team in there. And I'm sure once this airs off and I end up telling you guys, it's gonna be a pretty <laughs> it's it's gonna be a good spot. So especially a couple of my buddies and the former teammates will also hopefully be going there. So I think the team that in this next coming year that I'll be going to is going to look extra scary. Right. Love, okay. to hear. So, Love to hear. So with that though, the dispersal draft then, I mean, guys are pretty much negotiating with other teams and then the dispersal draft kind of goes based on those negotiations that happen. I'm, I'm assuming that's kind of how it works. Like, I guess take Brock, take us through the process of kind of like what, what it is like, what, what does the player have to do as of right now to then being on a team in 2025? Uh, okay, so usually how it goes, like with like this, this might be my first time, but it was it's actually pretty straightforward. When they send out an email, human resources like the MLR and the MLRPA and all those guys send out an, a thing, and then the first thing they send you is like a webinar, which we were all involved in asking questions stuff. But then they send out a separate link, which is say either option in or option out of the of the dispersal draft. Obviously, like ninety five percent of us optioned in, so like we're all up on the table. And then through that, once you option in everyone around the league all the teams have like their draft spots and like depending on where they were in the standings expense judge and they all go through and there's like three rounds and it's like one to 11 one to 10 or whatever it is and so what the that now opens up since now technically well now that dallas is officially folded we are now open open for business so what i went through is i was i got a message from the miami management and they messaged me and we had a good chat and talked to them and that's like kind of how it goes and i, I don't know how other players have gone on but i feel like that's what teams are doing once that that uh like the the ability, like once Dallas was finally taken off the market, free reign for management to start calling. So that's literally what happened. And guys were just getting calls. Like a lot of my buddies were getting calls from all over the West Coast. Like <laughs> love that. So like that's how it goes. And then you option, and then once Wednesday, like tomorrow, I guess comes around. That's when we all all the boys get drafted and stuff. So I guess you you guys will be staying uh, keeping close eye on that and see where all the all yep. the fellas go. So, but it was honestly an easy process. It's one of those things. It's like either option in, option out. Be part of this webinar, and then you go from there. And then after that. The teams have free reign to message you, talk to you, and then or your agency, and then you give them your agent, and then they go through the whole numbers process stuff that we us players aren't shouldn't do because you know that's why we have agents. So, yeah. and then that's pretty much it. It's honestly probably one of the easiest processes I've ever been through. So, so from from what we're getting from you, then Brock, is that this this conversations are happening with teams. A dispersal draft is supposed to happen Wednesday. Is there when it comes to these dispersal drafts? Because obviously we went through it last year with the folding of of the arrows and 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 New York yeah, and all that. Um, <laughs> is it more so like our player, like our teams, basically knowing? Because I think that's the conversation that a lot of fans have. Is like 
do the players know where they're going before the dispersal draft happens? Like that's kind of like how we got it with Co when we had the conversation with him is he had the conversation with LA and like LA knew that they were picking him and like other teams kind of knew to not pick Co because they had that conversation beforehand. Like are any teams going out on a limb and picking a guy that they haven't had a conversation with and that they don't know? Or is it kind of, you know what I'm saying? Like that, that type of type of deal. I, I, that is exactly it. Cause I actually had a conversation with Mitch cause we were, when we first met, met up in, in Dallas and we came roommates and stuff, he kind of went through the whole process of the whole dispersal draft. And so like, so like, again, there's sometimes teams will message you and call you beforehand. Like, Hey, if we use our pick, are you wanting to come here? Like, it's one of those mm-hmm. things like they want to like, just to know in advance. And then you give them a yes, no. But there are times like Mitch, there was a couple of times, like they were going to pick him and like during the draft and they would call him and like, can we take you? And Mitch was like, no. So they would just skip over. So mm-hmm. like that was leading, like that was the day of the draft. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I've never heard anything about them drafting. I think actually, no, that's a lie. I've heard about a couple of players last year in the draft. I got drafted by the team, but that's end up signing because that's not where they wanted to go. And then they're open. And then once you say no, after that, the next week, you're a free agent. So you can actually sign wherever you go huh. after that. So you can either option in, but if you don't like the team you go to or are wanting to be a part of it, you just just say no and then the next week you just get be put up on a free agency thing and oh. then you, you then you're free reign from there so but it's not very common like i've only seen yeah. one or two players do that um and then so but that's like pretty much what i've seen from it but usually i think from what co and like mitch has said like they usually call you in advance yeah because yeah. Yeah, yeah. they want to know it's interesting yeah it's just it's just crazy because i think to ryan's point we never get any insight on this uh but I think all the people, I think I know that we're looking forward to hearing what's next mm-hmm, for you. Mm-hmm. What's next for all the Dallas Jackals guy. we got one more question for you, Brock, moving away from the MLR before we let you go. And we appreciate your time, but just want to get your insight on that PNC uh, tournament. I know it wasn't necessarily the most successful tours, uh, but it's a tour nonetheless. And a tour is always a good time, especially when you're representing your country. I uh, just wanted to get your thoughts on how that went for you uh, and what your thoughts were on that with, uh, with everything that was going on with Canada. Oh man, it was unreal. Obviously said like, obviously when I got to put on my first tour in Ottawa and put on the Jersey for the first two times and having my family there, it was something that like, it's one of those things you have to live through and witness and be a part of to actually know how it feels. Cause words can't describe it, especially seeing the face, like the, the reaction of my family that were there and seeing me in the Jersey and like seeing all the hard work that you put in throughout the years and all the sacrifice you had to make to finally reach that end goal of being an international rugby player. One thing to make it professionally, but another thing to represent your country is, you know, something you just can't put into words. Uh, but that PNC tour was probably one of the, if not the best rugby tour I've been on, just as far as it's like being away for six weeks. Like that is your life. Like you're actually living the rugby life. These guys that you see, like the all blacks and stuff, like they're on tour traveling or hotel living, like all this type of stuff that we lived it for a bit. Like me, you and me, Matt, like when we were in Wales, the three weeks there to play that, but like being in like a full men's setup and like, kind of just Different. like the way they treat you. It's crazy. Like just all on the constant move, travel, all this media, all this type of stuff, just like, all these obligations you have to do. It was just like, wow, like I'm literally the person that I, I grown up wanting to be watching, <laughs> like seeing and, and be living it. And it was awesome. Like, as far as like the games went, like the whole plan for this year is just to like, help grow. Like, as you saw, like on the rosters and the other guys that even didn't yeah. get capped yet, we have a very young team. It's about, put, our goal is to qualify in 2025. So next year is the year that we're going to start ramping things up. But this year was probably to get guys like myself, younger guys, guys that need experience caps and then start pushing us funneling us through so that we have we have an extended squad leading up to the world cup and the qualification so it's about growing and becoming better as a team and getting guys a new fresh face looking guys into the system and get them accustomed to test rugby so and i definitely don't think like uh, despite the record showing for itself there was definitely some games the u.s game was very disappointing and we that was probably still to this day haunts a lot of us and it's still and like again me and Belaski weren't didn't get on the field so that again that's just added motivation and just a little bit of added like being a little bit more upset than others even though because especially myself like i believe that i i make a big impact wherever i am and i definitely deserve like i felt like me speaking confidently not cocky if i were to be on that pitch in that u.s game i would have made a difference and it would have helped yeah. personally but end of the day coach's decision you got it back in one of those things but as like a team like it's just a game that we felt like we let go and it kind of shown just the mistakes and the attempt and the things that we let the U S do to us when, when we should capitalize on that, on those uh, mistakes was one thing, but like Tonga, another thing too, like so physical and like those type and like, those so games. Big. Oh man. And I think that was another game we could have come away with, but it just shows like 
you look at our team, you look at our starting 15, you look at the 23, you look at the guys on the tour, not a lot of experience there. And these, the way the numbers we're putting up against these teams, even Japan, like despite the score, like put up 28 truck points. And we like, the yeah. first half was a little bit of craziness. Like it was just like floodgates <laughs> a little bit, but like the last 10, 20 minutes of the first half, like we were like getting our feet wet, getting flowing, running good rugby, keeping the ball in hand and made a huge difference. And then the second half, again, we looked, Gave up some tries that we shouldn't have. And again, just shows like the type of skill set and like obviously just the play the talent that Japan has. And they're coaching. Like, where are they like they're le- there's levels to this. But like what we were able to produce in that second half and like show from like all 23 of us just shows that there is a bright future leading into this next qualification thing. Cause there are guys, even despite the fact a lot of guys that we have on that team didn't play MLR, we're playing mm-hmm. in just like Nat two in France, like guys that just don't have a lot of experience, but we're able to put on the Canadian Jersey and put up a good performance. Whether it was 10 minutes, five minutes or a full 80. I think there's some bright things and like good things to look into, like look forward to coming up in this yeah. coming test season. And we still got November tour. We play in Chile and Romania yep. and Romania. I think those are both e- not easily, but those are both winnable games. We already beat Romania yep. and Ottawa. And we put up a pretty convincing performance against them. Obviously, we're going to their backyard, so it might be a little bit different. Always different playing a different, like, the oppo- opposing team's country. But I think we can also upset, again, Romania. And I, from what I've heard, and a lot of the older guys that have been a part of this team for a while and what happened with Chile last time, we are definitely oh, get oh Chile a little bit of payback for what they did yeah. in the qualification yeah. year, year going into 2023. So I think 100%. we can easily go undefeated. No, not easily. I don't want to say it like that. But I think we <laughs> can, go unde- uh, can go undefeated. And end off this 2024 international window with two good wins leading and in, going into the 2025 and then another summer test series, depending who we play there, mm-hmm. get build up some more momentum and another PNC season, build up some momentum, maybe come away with a couple more games, get some wins under our belt in that and then the qualification. And then we're in firing. And then, then we've had a whole year and a half of getting guys like myself and the all younger guys and guys with less experience yeah. and less caps more experience, more exposure and being able to actually put up like con- like uh, convincible numbers against these guys, other teams, yeah. and these other nations and qualify off the first get go. Yeah. I yeah, think, I think I- that's the, the sentiment that, that Co was saying when he came on the show, that's what Q was saying when he came on the show, obviously we got our Canadian connection here. Um, but I think Canada fans, I told, we told Co this and we told Q this, that there has been a little bit of concern amongst Canadian fans about kind of the direction of which Rugby Canada has been going, at least the trend. Um, so I think they're all going to be very excited to hear about this kind of young wave coming through and the potential that there could be. And again, you said maybe not the the best uh, uh, showing that we saw in the PNCs, but I think a lot of people will be looking forward to those November tests um, against Chile and Romania to see kind of where you guys uh, where you guys are progressing towards. Canadian no. fans love your love your confidence, Brock. We love your confidence, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, and we've loved kind of the, the the confidence that you've you've shown to us throughout this show, and and it's been great kind of getting to hear the insider look on all of this. Absolutely, uh, and uh, and 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 stay tuned for the people. Hey, yeah, you are going to find out where Brock Gallagher, former nine for the Dallas Jackal, is going to go in what a, cu- a couple weeks, a few days. I think, where, so. what if- I think once the draft right. ends, um, and then that type of thing, or if I get drafted, I'm not too sure because like I already signed the contract. So yeah. either I'm already locked in and didn't have to do the draft, or I'll be in the draft. Same thing. So you'll see my name somewhere in the next coming weeks, okay. hopefully. But yeah. No, it's I'm I'm excited. I think it couldn't worked out better. It doesn't work. It couldn't have worked out better for where my living situation, as far as being closer to home, like stuff like that. Like this is overall a really good like business move for my long term future, wherever it may be. I think just overall and just over, it's just a better situation than I had <laughs> in Dallas, as far as being closer to my family, etc., and like stuff like there that. Like that. so, it's exciting. Love to hear it. Love to hear it. Well, again, uh, Brock Gallagher, uh, former nine for the Dallas Jackals, to be determined where he's going to end up for 2025. Like we said in the news and notes, the season is supposed to be starting in February, so not too long away here uh, for our fans to spot what jersey uh, Brock Gallagher will be wearing. But Brock, appreciate your time, man. Thanks as always, and uh, we'd love to have you on at any time. No, thank you. I appreciate it. Hey, shoot me a message like you did last time. And I'm, <laughs> I'll be happy. Uh, I've I have nothing but time on my hands. Even in season, I did a lot of interviews and stuff. And it's honestly probably one of the best things I could do. And honestly, it makes me no happier than coming on things like this. Having a good chat. So wait, my door's always Thanks, open. Man. Awesome. I appreciate Thanks, it. dude. And thank you again to uh, Bar- Brock Gallagher for joining us here on the Fantasy Rocker Show. First time appearance, but sounds like First you might have appearance. him uh, on maybe a couple more times here. Another Definitely friend will. of the show. Um, but man, talk about interesting things coming out of 
Well, what the heck start, went on this off season? Let's start with one. Uh, love the confidence coming out of that guy. Oh yeah. I mean, I love the fact that he just knows what he, what he's capable of. And I think that's something that you love to see in a player. I think it's useful for fantasy wise as well, because you know, a guy that's that that's confident what he's capable of is going to put up some points for you. I can promise you that because mentality yeah. That's 99% of the battle, baby. Does it does uh, it worry you at all, Maddie? That's probably the confidence he had. I know we started our conversation and being all nice to you about your scrum half skills, but I'm pretty sure in his head, he won't tell us to this or tell you to your face, but I'm sure he had that same confidence when he was going up against you back in the heyday. Yeah, well, you know what? He didn't need it. <laughs> it's okay. He was faster. He was stronger. He didn't It's need good it. self-awareness okay? that you have. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it, it's it's not self awareness. It's just running a fifty meter dash and realizing <laughs> that you're really not fast. So uh, that's just that thing. Uh, but yeah, it, it was crazy how much how open he was with us, which mm-hmm. we really appreciate. Yeah, and yeah. just everything that he shared. The one thing that really was wide open for me, or a couple things, I guess, is one, just the like the fact that the lack of transparency that the players mm-hmm. had, how the ownership knew what they were doing since the start of the year. Yeah. Uh, which, which makes sense. Now that we look back, it's like, why would you want to sell? Like, why would you fold after such a successful season? Right. Well, because they lost 30% of their ownership at the yeah. start of the year. So it didn't matter how the season went. Yeah. If they didn't find anything else. Uh, so that was definitely eye opening to me. And the next thing is just, you know, I hate to harp on this, but just the idea of like, he said that the dispersal draft is happening Wednesday. Uh, the league has not announced anything up or to this shared point anything up to this, this point related to a dispersal draft. Yep. So clearly there is some sort of uh, disconnect between what's actually happening and then what is uh, what's going to happen. Uh, but regardless, it is what it is. I'm glad it seems a lot smoother this time around with the whole PA and players association being, mm-hmm, players mm-hmm, association mm-hmm. being involved. Uh, so love to hear that for the players. Uh, but yeah, it, it does. It was a crazy conversation. Yeah. And just a lot of insight into that. I think, again, for me, it does sound like that Dallas Jackals front office. There were maybe some, uh, oh, I'll, I'll put the conjecture in. I it, think, it I think Brock like... said one person. Yeah. I so believe I I'm remember not... saying one person. So one person over there is a bit of a slimy. And and when it comes to tough business, I don't know. It's, that's, it's, just, it's just crazy to me how little in the know the players were when it came to this. And and you would think that it would maybe be a little bit more um kind of on the same page. But again, I guess that's that's kind of how it has been playing out. And I think to your point, Maddie, about the smoothness, I mean the league has gone through this before. So I think oh, they know kind of what to do. Like this. Yeah. So again, I guess you could take that as a good thing, take that as, as, as a not so good thing, but nonetheless, it is something. So yeah, according to Brock, the dispersal draft is happening some point today uh, when we release this podcast Wednesday. Um, I'm sure we'll see results at some point uh, come Months. out and be released. Uh, it, it's very interesting to hear about the process. We've heard about the process kind of we'll from guys to. that we've had on before with Co, who went through it. Um, now Brock going through it. Um, and it's going to be exciting to hear where uh, where it's, Brock is uh, announcing where he will somewhere be. On the West Coast. Somewhere, somewhere on the West Coast. Somewhere on the West Coast. I guess uh, we'll find out. And, and look, I'm assuming that something's going to get released within the next couple of weeks. You know, that's what he was kind of saying that things will be released next couple of weeks. I, I'm, I know that we're going to hear things coming out of Brian Ray and some of those guys, yeah. uh, with between now and then. So we'll see. Uh, but I guess speaking of losing investment, Ryan, don't stop it. Speaking stop of it. losing investment, Ryan, stop it. we better get to our next segment. Yes, yes. Losing investment. Uh, the Dallas Jackals might have lost 30% of their investment, but I lost 100, 100% of my investment this <laughs> past week. So let's get into it. Uh, Triple D, Devin's Degenerate Dambles, brought to you by Betstamp. Betstamp betting made easy. Um, not so easy for me, though, this uh, past week. And we've had a fantasy Rutgers betting challenge going on between myself and Vandy over the course of uh, our partnership. Uh, with Betstamp. Um, again, we partnered with Betstamp to give our viewers and listeners the best possible uh, betting deals, new user deals in their area. Very cool feature that they have. And- we have a link down below that you can click on that it basically curates, knows your location, curates all the sports books that are available 
in your area, ones that you may already be signed up for, and definitely ones that you're not signed up for, um, and just get view all the new user deals. So if you want to find the best lines, um, you go on there, you can sign up for these sports books, get some good deals at it, and it's really cool. I just found out uh, after my conversation with Betstamp that Fanatics now has a new sports book, and it's available Let's in go. Pennsylvania. So Let's that's go. one that I'll be using, getting a new user deal of. So things like Our jerseys that, suck though. You'll, you'll be in the in the know for that. But yeah. anyways, hey, getting back. Also, well, I'm gonna say, Ryan, I'm adding on to the to, to the little little plug there. Mm-hmm. You know, you support Betstamp, sign up, make a bet. You also support the Fantasy Rockers. That's true. You support the fantasy rockers leagues and in some way you also might be able to support yourself that if you make the proper investment and in, which is what i didn't do this week so let's get into it um at this hey, point in time right yeah go ahead i was leading vandy you were over ten dollars heading into this week my poor oh, judgment and investment has lost me a whole bunch of uh, money and i, I don't now- know about that I don't know about it's, poor it was judgment. a tough one. So I don't we'll, think poor let, judgment. Let's has get to into let... it. So where where I went in, we saw that beautiful premiership starting the past weekend. We saw the the very interesting line of the Harlequins being underdogs. I bet five dollars in that, and unfortunately that lost. But you got unlucky. I can quote. Okay, even the players were saying after the game that a couple bounces of the ball the other way, Harlequins had that game. I. How many I, times is Vegas going to do this to me, though? Because I keep on getting these bad bounces that by one score it well, happened to me with the friggin' NPC Bunnings game a few weeks ago. <sighs> I can't stand it anymore. And the okay. rugby championship. That one was even worse. I mean, this you, had that, you had that. I, I had that locked I would. I would like to quote you on saying that this is probably the closest I felt thing. the best about this one in a long time. And now, now I'm going to feel really good about this upcoming one. All right. So and I'll tell well, you why. I'll tell you why. Let's talk about it again. Okay. I well, lost money with yeah. the premiership bet there, yeah. uh, choosing the underdog Harlequins at the, uh, at the line that I got. I believe it was like plus 110 or something like that. And yeah, then I, I parlayed the money line between what I thought was two basically 100% hey, wins. Uh, hey, you were one, one kick. One kick that went wide away from being a richer man. Yeah, except now I'm a poor man, which is great. But anyways, New Zealand got the job done beating Australia, but somehow South Africa got upset by Argentina. I'm sick and tired of Argentina making these weird upsets at you know, these points in the love seasons. It. Yeah. I kind of love it. They're second in the rugby championship. I it's love crazy. seeing Argentina, Argentina do crazy. well. Uh, and, and the crazy thing is I think New Zealand and Australia are fighting for the wooden spoon. Uh, which, this upcoming week, which so, is which is which is interesting to see. Yeah, you don't ever hear that. But no, uh, um, we're going to do this let, a little bit differently, yeah. though, Maddie. This okay. is how we're going to do this one. I am going to. I feel really good about a, a parlay. This okay, weekend. so I'm going to give you what I am thinking. Okay, enough of you giving me advice and straight up me just going. I'm gonna. I went in here and I've decided what I think I'm going to do this weekend. You okay. can tell if that's a bad idea bad or idea. a good idea. It's and you can tell idea. me what you are thinking. Okay? okay. So let's let's go through this. Let's start off and let's start get, with rugby championship. Let's start off with the rugby championship. Okay. Yeah. What you see the lines here. Yeah. New Zealand is favored by 18 and a half. South yeah. Africa is favored by 18 and a half. Yeah. I think I'm going. I think this is worse than the week before, but I think I have to go with a parlay of South Africa, New Zealand, straight up winning this one. Okay. Right? Uh, South Africa, New Zealand are both home this week. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yes, I agree. That parlay should work. I am 100% agreeing with that parlay. Now. There's so, one now, of them's going to lose. One of them is going to freaking lose. If you want to make it even more spicy. All right. All right. Australia, Argentina, parlay. Cover the spread, both of them. All right. Well, let, let's look. <laughs> I don't like when you bring these spicy I, 18, things. In. 18 and a half. Okay. 18 okay. and a half. Look, New Zealand can't score in the last 20 minutes. They have yet to score in the last 20 minutes. And every game they're leading by a lot, it ends up being close at the end of the game. I think Ar- Australia is definitely going to be winning 18 and a half. Argentina, I don't think 18 and a half is a lot of points. I am a bit worried that South Africa is at home. So maybe to balance that out, what you do is you go Australia covers the spread parlay 
with South Africa money line. Okay. So, okay. Put it in perspective, I think the value between New Zealand and South Africa parlay money line at minus 1400 and minus 1200 is like you just can't do that to be, you bet five dollars you win 80 cents so like that's that's oh. not a good investment especially at zero. the risk of what can happen uh from last week but if i do what you're saying uh maddie that's actually not a bad call plus Brian, one, plus 102 i like that one a lot okay all right so you're saying parlay the 18 and a half spread that australia is getting um, they cover or they 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 get the they lose within 18 and a half and South Africa wins one. Well, that's not too bad. That's not too bad. I like All that right. one a lot. Let me give you my final bet here. Um, I am not uh uh touching top 14 no. with a 10 foot pole. No, also week. also run away from NPC at this point. I have no clue. I thought I had a clue. I have no clue anymore. I don't know. I know you have one one that you th you're thinking of, but I, I I don't know. Okay. I'm, I, I watched I watched North Harbor get beat by Northland, <laughs> get a spanking. I watched Counties Manukau absolutely uh spank Otago. Like I, I I'm not I saw Waikato spank Hawks Bay. I, I'm not sure. I'm not okay. quite sure. The happening. one that I'm leaning towards is a Saturday matchup between Tasman and Otago. Okay. I see that. Tasman is second in the rankings. They have yet to lose a match this season. Otago is down in 11. They're three and five. Tasman is favored by four and a half. Tasman has got to beat Otago by four and a half, right? And I said that <laughs> about a lot of NPC games. There you go. All right. Well, that's what I'm leaning for NPC. Let's finish off here with the premiership. Good luck with that one. Let's finish off with the premiership. Um, the one match that I like is uh, between the Sale Sharks and the Saracens. And I'm actually looking at picking Sale as the plus 300 underdogs in this one. Hey, Ryan, what happens if you do a uh, money line parlay okay. of Harlequins over Newcastle and Exeter over Northampton? All right. So what do you want there? You want Harlequins winning by more than 23 and a half? No, money line. No money line or is it just... Oh, oh all money line. Okay. Money so line. Harlequins yeah. and... And then uh, Exeter over Northampton. Plus 316. That's pretty good. All right. I like that one too. <laughs> all right. So there we got, we got two picks um, that Nadi, I think, is locking himself in on. He's going with the parlay of... Australia is able to lose within 18 and a half no, against not, New Zealand. I'm not doing anything. Parlayed with South Africa getting the money line win. You get pretty good odds on that at, at plus 100. And then he's looking at the money line of Harlequins over Newcastle and Exeter over Northampton. That gives you plus 316. That Exeter that's over cool. Northampton one, that's going to be a tough one. Okay. Wait, why are you, why, 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 why are you why doing that? Gonna go. I'm just saying it's, it, it's an the, interesting is that, one. Is that your biggest, is that the most likely upset of the week in your premiership picks? Exeter's, Do you like Exeter uh, Ex, over Ex, Northampton? Exeter is underdogs, right? Yes. Oof. I mean, I don't mind it, but it's kind of a tough one. What about Sale over Saracens? What I went with. Yeah, I could see that one too. Try that one. Try that part like uh, premiership is a tough one for me too. All right. Well, all right. Well, sounds like your pick of the week, Maddie. And Australia, the week eight and one. a half spread. Yes. South Africa money line win. Uh, I might I have like to go that, that one. one. I'm gonna have to 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 see there. All right. Well, um, Bandy will pop in his picks. I'm sure he'll be taking notes listening to this podcast. But again, this yeah. is the Fantasy Records Betting Challenge brought to you by Betstamp. Betstamp betting made easy. Again, check out the link down below for all the sports books available in your area and get the best new user deals that are available. There's a whole bunch of them um, on there. I'll, I'll pull it up. I, I'm based out of uh, of of Pennsylvania. Um, we're getting some uh, some things as good as uh, as uh, on your draft. Kings, which has most of the rugby odds that we've been doing bet five dollars get a hundred and fifty dollars in bonus bets so just some good deals that you can cash in on there um when it comes to betting in rugby and then you'll have your account all set up for when the mlr comes around in february and be able to yep. make some bets with us when it comes to betting in major league rugby um all right maddie well hey uh Fun episode. A lot of insight there. Again, thank you to Brock Gallagher for hopping on the show, giving us a whole bunch of insight into what all went down this offseason. Um, again, just a lot of a lot of interesting tidbits there. Uh, Maddie, anything that you have left for the people? Rest in peace, Jackals.
Rest in peace, Jackals. All right. For Matt Yee, for Devin Vandy Vanderpool, we'll be back next week with another episode of the Fantasy Rucker Show. Woof, 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 woof. You've been listening to the Fantasy Rucker Show, bringing fantasy rugby to the masses, covering everything rugby from the MLR and beyond. We hope you enjoyed the show. Make sure to like, rate, and review, and be sure to tell all your friends. We'll be back soon, but in the meantime, connect with us on social media at the Fantasy Ruckers. Till next time, this is the Fantasy Ruckers Show, signing off.